My name is Nancy Higgins. I'm currently the Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for Bechtel, which is a global engineering and construction company. This is the fourth major company that I have done this job for, <laughs> and I've been doing it probably since 1994 or so. I, after, I did this at Boeing and at Lockheed Martin, or I ran their program, and then left Lockheed Martin to join MCI after the WorldCom debacle when they were in bankruptcy and suspended um, from doing business with the federal government. Had a time that was about, what, three months before their largest customer, the U.S. government contract, was going to be up for bid, and if they weren't off the suspension and debarment list by then, they would not be able to renew that contract. And then um, I was there for a few years when we sold the company to Verizon, and I took a year off and uh, walked the Camino de Santiago in Spain and then uh, decided that I missed working for a company and went back to work at Bechtel in San Francisco. Bechtel was the first company that I worked at that really had no idea what an ethics and compliance program would look like. They were, they are a, a basically a family-owned company where ethics is so key to their um, to their self-view and the DNA, as they like to say, of the company. What they didn't understand was what a program was. We're ethical. Why would we need a program? I think when they brought me in, they really thought that an ethics and compliance program meant um, complying with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, because that's one of the biggest risks of an international um, global uh, co company like Bechtel. But um, you know, they, uh, they've been tremendously supportive and just kind of accepted what we've done. And now I've been there almost 12 years, and people can't imagine what it was like before they had an ethics and compliance program. It's so built into the way the company runs. I continue to believe that, um, for the most part, the best ethics officers are those who are lawyers because it's so important to know where that line is so you never get close to it. But there's a lot of activity that is really a business decision, and the management can decide to do um, – they can pretty much decide how they're going to run their company um, as long as they don't cross that line. And you don't ever want to get close to the line, but you want to know where that is. I think one of the problems with um, ethics officers who are not legally trained is they tend to confuse the company policies with the law rather than recognizing that they can be changed. Most of the training that people received was in areas of the law or compliance training that um, companies were afraid that you would violate. And the most likely ones in the defense industry had to do with, with defense. Um, what we didn't have a lot of was training that allowed people to practice, um, you know, to practice recognizing and resolving ethics issues. Um, and the realization over time that the most important part of the program was the values. And because, you know, we learned pretty quickly that you couldn't have a policy to address every conceivable thing that, a company, that an employee could do to cause trouble for the company. Uh, but we, um, we could teach them what was expected of uh, employees in terms of how the company wanted to be thought of, what you wanted to represent. And so they would ask questions. Uh, and, you know, we all knew that even if you had a policy, there was nothing you could do to stop someone who knew the rules to decide to break them. But you can't have them make sure they know you're not, they're not doing it for the company. That's not what the company is asking of them. But and surround them with people who will recognize it. 
So I think um, over time we began to realize that there was a lot to be said for having people come to your ethics and compliance resources to ask for guidance in advance um, to help to understand what would be expected rather than only reporting um, instances of suspected misconduct. And that did come about gradually and I think is is still in place at most companies today. I'm not real optimistic about how programs will work in the future. I think it's so much easier to decide that things should be run by, um, you know, computer algorithms to um, have everything done by data. I'm concerned about the um, collection of data um, in these vast data lakes with, um, you know, the thought that, um, you know, while they're intended in most cases in ways to make the company more efficient and improve um, business, the way business is run, I think they have the um, capacity to, you know, make people feel like they're working for Big Brother. And that's going to make people not trust you. You know, so without transparency of how your processes work um, and having employees recognize, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it um, is for the benefit of the company, um, then people aren't going to come forward and talk to you about things that we need to know about. A long time ago, I was thinking about this. I thought, well, what, what does the ethics program do? And it, it's kind of like when you're raising children and, you know, you can get all the values in them that when they're growing up and you hope that when they get to an age of um, adolescence, when they'll never talk to the parent that, you know, it's in there, but you want them to have somebody to talk to. You, you know, talk to a teacher, a counselor, a clergyman or, or whomever, an aunt, <laughs> Um, but talk to somebody if you won't talk to me. And that's really what we have in our ethics programs, our, in our code of conduct guidance and the hotline where you can call and ask for advice. You know, we're sort of that trusted other person. We're, as a program, we're trying to peer-proof our children, <laughs> peer-proof the employees so they know what to do and they'll go ask for help if they see something that doesn't feel right.